a stitch of fancy. An M-inspired story scene, written by Leany Brown and narrated by Christopher, a cloned voice made available by the voice actor through the Eleven Labs library. Author's note, A Stitch of Fancy is a scene that fits into the following excerpt from Volume 2, Chapter 12 of Emma by Jane Austen, because it could very possibly be one of Emma's imaginings with which she entertained herself as she worked. Emma continued to entertain no doubt of her being in love, her ideas only varied as to the how much. At first she thought it was a good deal, and afterwards but little. She had great pleasure in hearing Frank Churchill talked of, and for his sake greater pleasure than ever in seeing Mr and Mrs Weston. She was very often thinking of him, and quite impatient for a letter that she might know how he was, how were his spirits, how was his aunt, and what was the chance of his coming to Randall's again this spring. But on the other hand she could not admit herself to be unhappy, nor after the first morning to be less disposed for employment than usual, she was still busy and cheerful, and pleasing as he was she could yet imagine him to have faults, and father, though thinking of him so much, and as she sat drawing or working, forming a thousand amusing schemes for the progress and close of their attachment, fancying interesting dialogues and inventing elegant letters. The conclusion of every imaginary declaration on his side was that she refused him. Their affection was always to subside into friendship, Everything tender and charming was to mark their parting, but still they were to part. When she became sensible of this, it struck her that she could not be very much in love, for in spite of her previous and fixed determination never to quit her father, never to marry, a strong attachment certainly must produce more of a struggle than she could foresee in her own feelings. Extracted from Jane Austen's Emma, a stitch of fancy by Leany Brown. Emma's needle pierced the fabric and she slowly drew it through, as she glanced toward the very window where Mr Churchill had stood those many days ago, fidgeting and preparing to declare his intentions. She smiled at the memory, poked the needle back through the fabric, and then made sure the thread lay just as it should on the front of her piece before turning her thoughts back to such a pleasant distraction as Mr Churchill presented. He was quite in love with her. She was firmly convinced of this fact. He had acted the part. His attentions and words had been so amiable, so charming, so warm, very much as they should be for a gentleman in love, even if he were only at the start of an ardent journey. Her needle stopped its work altogether and rested in her lap atop the material on which she was working as her thoughts drifted away in fancy. Miss Woodhouse, I can no longer remain silent. Mr Frank Churchill began his declaration as he rose from the chair in which he had been sitting, speaking to her of music and dances. My feelings are too great and cannot be ignored a moment longer. Indeed, I have suffered a great deal just now, trying with no small amount of effort to overlook them. He paced to the window and, after an affectionate look at her, peered out as if pondering what he should say next. Smiling at the intensity of the warmth in his words, Emma lowered her eyes to look at her hands. It was pleasing to have a man such as Mr Frank Churchill declare such things, even if the feelings could not, and must not, be returned. Highbury has become such a place of happiness for me, he continued. I would never have dreamt it when I arrived. But it has. The town, the people, Mrs. Weston Hartfield. He paused in his speech and crossed to where she sat, where he, once again, took his seat in her hand. You, you, my dear Emma, have become of special delight to me and I do not think that my happiness can remain complete without you. I'm certain you are mistaken, she replied. There are a great many things which will and do bring you happiness. Indeed, you have mentioned several just now. She thought about removing her hand from his grasp, but it was a small thing to allow. You're enamoured with Highbury, but when you move on to town or Bath or some other locale, you will find your view of this place waning and your new neighbourhood will surely quell any sadness that is in your heart from missing Highbury. You are not one to be melancholy for long. Your disposition would not allow it. You are mistaken, he said with some force. There shall never be another to claim your place. My heart is completely and entirely yours. He lifted her hand, and she, not wishing to cause him any greater pain than she was going to do, allowed him to kiss it. It would be a liberty he could later reflect on with some small amount of pleasure once the pain had subsided, of course. You must marry me, he continued. Come away with me to Enscombe and be my wife. Oh, 
that I cannot do. She made certain to make her expression as grieved as she possibly could, which in reality was not so very hard to do, for disappointing a friend always did make her feel cheerless. I cannot leave my father. He quite depends on me. He can come with us? Emma shook her head. He cannot leave Hartfield, nor can I. She sighed and smiled sadly. Perhaps if my feelings were more than they are, I might be persuaded, but unfortunately they are not. You are a good friend, truly one of the best. I love you dearly for your attentions, and we do enjoy ourselves when we are together. There is no lack of discussion. Yes, yes, I feel the same, he interrupted. Again Emma shook her head. No, you feel more. Your heart has been touched, but mine has not. At least not as it should be touched if one is to accept an offer of marriage. You will not have me. His look of regret tugged at her heart. But what could be done? She could not marry where her whole heart was not engaged. Why, it would be utter foolishness to accept an offer of marriage when one did not feel inclined and did not have a necessity to do so. I do apologise, she said. He sighed as one should at such a blow. For a moment, as he sat silent beside her, she wondered if he would storm off and accuse her of having led him on, but he did not. Instead, he released her hand, sank back into his chair and said, I shall not leave you be. I'll continue to work on your affections. She smiled. You may say it, but another will soon capture your fancy and you will be lost to me. He chuckled and shrugged one shoulder. The despair of the moment prior faded with each breath he drew. He sat there in the chair next to her for some minutes. At the beginning of this silent interlude, he looked at her as if considering something, but after three or four minutes ticked into the past, he allowed his eyes to wander to the window. A moment longer, and he rose, straightened his jacket, then crossed to look out the window toward the drive. Did you say you expect your pretty friend to call? With a sigh, Emma lifted her needle again, and forced it through the material once more. Yes, yes, that was just how it would be. Mr. Churchill would be pleased wherever he was, and she would be his contented friend at Hartfield, always and forever at Hartfield. Thank you for listening to A Stitch of Fancy. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please help other readers find it by liking this video and sharing it. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications to be notified when I upload another video. The 2023 copyright for Tales from Pemberley and other sweet story vignettes in which a stitch of fancy can be found is held by Leany Brown. All rights reserved. The narrator for this story has been Christopher, a cloned voice made available by the voice actor through the Eleven Labs library.